Previously, we discussed why even a representative government requires a Bill of Rights to prevent it from abusing the liberties of its constituents. And to further address Hamilton's popular sovereignty argument, I would like to analyze the words of Robert Yates, a prominent anti-federalist who wrote under the pseudonym Brutus. And Yates further notes that elected representatives are no less keen on expanding their own power than our monarchs. He observes that rulers have the same propensities as other men. They are as likely to use the power with which they are vested for private purposes and to the injury and oppression of those over whom they are placed, as individuals in a state of nature are to injure and oppress one another. It is therefore as proper that bounds should be set to their authority as that government should have at first been instituted to restrain private injuries. What Yeats is saying here is that whether one is in the state of nature, under a monarchy, or under a representative government, one is likely to encounter powerful people who intend to violate one's liberties. A person's ambition and hunger for power are not diminished because he happens to be acting in the name of the people. Indeed, such persons may even usurp power more readily because they are generally perceived to be acting in the common interest of those who elected them. This is why Thomas Jefferson wrote to James Madison that a bill of rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth and what no just government should refuse. Furthermore, it may be that popular opinion hostile to liberty is the threat against which a Bill of Rights needs to protect individuals. In Madison's words, the prescriptions in favor of liberty ought to be leveled against that quarter where the greatest danger lies, namely, that which possesses the highest prerogative of power. But this is not found in either the executive or legislative departments of government, but in the body of the people, operating by the majority against the minority. If the culture or the interests of the majority of the people are such as to consider some individuals lucrative targets for oppression, then a Bill of Rights can help protect otherwise helpless minorities against violation. A Bill of Rights can serve as a rallying point for anyone who is not a member of the oppressing majority, and give such individuals an ability to clearly identify and agree on which rights are being violated and how. With legitimacy on its side, the oppressed minority may succeed in protecting itself via the legal system and other official mechanisms through which unpopular rights may still be somewhat enforced. Now, Alexander Hamilton alleges that bills of rights would be not only unnecessary, but would even be dangerous. They would contain various exceptions to powers not granted, and on this very account would afford a colorable pretext to claim more than were granted. For why declare that things shall not be done which there is no power to do. So Hamilton suggests that simply enumerating the government's positive powers and presuming that the government may do nothing outside the enumerated powers will suffice to prevent violations of the government's just limits. Now, of course, we know what happened to this in the real world as soon as Hamilton 
got into a position of power, he began claiming for the government unenumerated powers, such as, for instance, the power to establish a national bank. As James Madison points out, this argument fails to recognize that virtually any coercive action can be justified rhetorically as a means to one of the enumerated powers. Madison writes, It is true the powers of the general government are circumscribed. They are directed to particular objects. But even if government keeps within those limits, it has certain discretionary powers with respect to the means. Yeats makes an even stronger argument. He writes that the power, rights, and authority granted to the general government by this Constitution are as complete with respect to every object to which they extend as that of any state government. It reaches to everything which concerns human happiness. Life, liberty, and property are under its control. In order to be at all functional, a government needs to be permitted to perform certain roles, such as organizing a military or administering criminal punishments. But even if these are its sole enumerated powers, some clever statist will be able to claim that military conscription is a valid means for raising armies, and that torture of so-called enemies of the state, as defined by the state, is a proper method of punishment. Any end recognized as legitimate for governments to pursue can be pursued with immoral and unjust means, and a Bill of Rights is needed to declare these means improper in themselves.